we're looking at. Okay, well, let's look at Romans today. Woohoo! Romans. I'm the only one that woohoos when we do Romans. I thought, oh, oh, there we go. There we go. And this is the woohoo verse right here, in fact. We've, we're way past that. We're, we're now in chapter 7. But this is really, this is the flag that's planted in the ground on the summit of Paul's wonderful mountain that we call the Book of Romans. And he plants it there and he says, Therefore, it's chapter 5, verse 1, Since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And I want you to notice, it's in the past tense. It doesn't say, for instance, Therefore, since we will be justified once we get our works together, it doesn't say that. It says exactly the opposite. Since we have been justified by faith. So, you know, in many respects, you could think if the book of Romans is all about how are we made right with God, because that's what justification is, then why don't we just stop at chapter 5, verse 1? The end, close the book, ah, go home, you know, have some coffee and live life. Well, it, because there's, there's a part B to this whole process of what, what Jesus has done for us. Not only has he made us right with God through how he's died for us and raised for us, but he's actually in the process right now, after justification, of radically transforming who you are. Why? In order to substantiate and in order to make justification possible? No, that's already done. It's already done. That will never change. But he's changing us anyway. He's changing our hearts and our love for him and our dislove, our hate for sin, all that stuff. It's radical change. So when you talk about Christianity and what Jesus has done for us, it's twofold. And that's what Paul's getting at. Number one, we're made right with God. Number two, he's changing us. And he's changing our relationship with sin. And that's where we are today because it's, it's a great word. So let me recap a little bit here. Once you're born again, and the sentence that I'll use is this, now that we're instantly made right with God, boom, just like that, we're instantly made right with God, our ongoing involvement with sin is changing. And this is what's really cool. You don't have to sin anymore. And these are some points we've made already. Uh, this made right with God, that's the big, that's the $10 word justification. That's just, you know, the relationship with God is fixed. And our ongoing involvement with sin that's part of this big word sanctification. It's a, it's a gradual change that doesn't really impact our justification. That's done. That's something Jesus does. But we're undergoing change after we've met Jesus. That's part of the sanctification. Not only are we ongoing involvement with sin is changing, but our involvement with God is changing as well. Those two things are happening. So that's what's going on. And he had three points to the sanctification thing, this gradual change we're going through. We saw that sin no longer rules us. And we saw that in the beginning of chapter 6. It doesn't rule us anymore. And the picture we used is this. The puppet master no longer can pull your strings. And who was the puppet master? Sin. Before Christ, you didn't have a choice. Now, you, a lot of people will say, wait, 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 wait. You mean I couldn't choose to do good before Jesus? Well, no, there's a, there's a moderate amount of good that we can do that we understand is good. We recognize it as good. But if you want to guarantee your life is sinless, you'll never make it. You can't do it. The puppet master, when it says it wants sin to happen, it raises a string and your arms go and you sin. So there's really, Paul says in chapter 6, before Christ, you're trapped. You're in bondage to sin. It's got you. It's got you. But in the beginning of 6, he says, but hey, good news. You've died with Christ. And can a dead thing get pulled up with a string? No, a dead thing is dead. So you're dead to sin. That control's gone. Woo! But that brings up a second problem. Not only is sin no longer ruling us, but now sin is voluntary. And why is this a problem? Because we still will elect to do it. But just remember, just remember, it's because you want to, not because you have to. So part of the sanctification process is to, is to wean us away from choosing to sin when we don't have to anymore. Now you're actually in a position where you don't have to sin. You don't have to. And we looked at it this way because this is how he uses it. It's like a payday. Why would you voluntarily elect to go to work for sin, which is how he puts it, to report for work for the day of sin, when you know that the payday at the end of your work day of sin is death? Well, why would you do that? And that, that's, his really, that's his good, coherent argument. You can now voluntarily sin if you want to, but why would you want to? Because after all, at the payday, don't you know that the wages of sin is death? And that's the context. Why would you do this? It's just going to lead to death. Now, many of us after Christ have gone back and we fall into some of the old habit patterns of sin and we, and we know we're not supposed to do them, but sin calls and we don't have to do the sin, but we say, but I think I'd just give it another taste. 
and you taste it and go, Pooey, why did I do that? This, this isn't going anywhere positive, but sin promised it would, and I get into it, and it all brings us death. So Paul's saving us a lot of heartache. He's saying, okay, you don't have to sin, but you still can if you want to. But just keep in mind, at the end of that payday is death. It's not life. It's not life. And then the third thing he brings up is the fact that the standard itself no longer binds us in terms of like wrapping a rope around it. He does this at the beginning of chapter 7. And the standard, what is the standard? That's this word that he calls law over and over again. The standard of what's right and wrong. And, and before Christ, that standard, especially for a Pharisee, for a Jew, that standard binds you. It's like it wraps a rope around you. And the rope's names are ought, should, could, you know, those kind of, those forces. I, I got to do this today because that's what I'm supposed to do. That's what everyone says. Ought. I'm sorry, not oughts. Yeah, must. There we go. <laughs> Offense. Offense in the ought family. So, yeah. So, so that's the standard. The, the, law, the law didn't go away, but the law doesn't constantly on a daily basis tie you up in ropes and say that you must do this. Okay? So, would it, could it, should it. That's what that is. And, and we use for that this picture right here, this poor guy under the law, that every day he wakes up and he says, okay, today I'm supposed to do this. Everyone says that I'm supposed to not do this. I guess I better make a list, check it twice, do everything right today. And then you get to the end of the day and you find out that despite your best efforts, you still lose and you wake up the next day and say, I guess I'll try again all over tomorrow. Oh, woe is me. I'm trying as hard as I can. I do my best. I hope Jesus does the rest. And that's, that's falsehood. That's, that's a life that's bound by the law. And that's not the role of the law. It wasn't meant to be lived like that. So he says we're, we're free from that. It no longer binds us. And he says this. In verse 6, we saw this. So that we may serve in the new way of the Spirit. And this is like the bombshell of Romans. Because up until this point, and we saw this last week, ladies, sorry about this, but up until this point in Romans, the word spirit has only, this is just the third time it's been used in all of Romans. And we're in chapter 7, third time. And he introduces this whole idea, well, what is, what is this new way of the spirit? And that's the bombshell. We're saying, hey, hey, if we're, if we're not supposed to be following the law every day, and if I don't have to sin anymore, and there's this new way of the spirit, I'm ready. What is this? Help me out here. Well, he's going to help us out in chapter 8, but we're still stuck in chapter 7. <laughs> and in chapter 8, remember I said this in 7, verse 6, chapter that's the third time the word spirit's been used. You know how many times it gets used in chapter 8? 22 times. So he's going to finally satisfy our curiosity about how do I live in the spirit? What is this new life in the spirit? I don't know what you're talking about, Paul. I don't get it at all. So that's what we want to go toward, but we are kind of right in the middle of a detour. <laughs> so we'll get to that next week. We'll get to that next week. And the detour we're in in chapter 7 is a very good detour and a good one, but you know, just hold on to that new way of the spirit idea. We'll get there next week. The detour is actually a question that rises up. And the question, which we're going to look at today, is, is the law bad? You know, because we just talked about being freed from being bound by the law and about doing right and sinning. So, so tell me, what is the law about? Why do I need the law? And if the law is just causing me to stumble, wh wh why did even God have it? Why is the law, is the law bad? Because the law seems to make me sin? I mean, I, what? Well, you've got to understand that we are looking at something that Paul took years to figure out. Because the first verse today, what then shall we say? That the law is sin? And of course, his answer is, by no means. He uses the same phrase several times in this question-answer kind of, teaching style. Is the law sin? Is the law bad for us? Or is the law good for us? I'm really confused about the law. And what we need to do is do a Pharisee flashback. So we can kind of get in Paul's heads for a second. So we're going to do a Pharisee flashback because I think when Paul came to Christ and he so missed the boat, he so missed that Jesus was the Messiah, and as a great Jew he's saying, okay, so, so I did the law, I understood the law, I was a perfect Pharisee, but I still missed it. So tell me, God, I think it was a decade question, tell me, God, why is the law there if it seemed to distract me from following who Christ was? Why is the law there? After all, in the movie with Charlton Heston, it was a really big deal. 
I mean, he went up to the mountain, he brought down the tablets. I mean, it was a really big deal. And God says, do this and live. Okay, so there's the law. I thought I had it right, Paul's thinking, in the beginning, right after the Damascus Road. I thought I had it right, but I had it all wrong. So where's the role of the law? And this is what I think took Paul a decade to unwind. How does this work? So we're going to have a uh, Pharisee flashback. I, I spell flashback wrong. Okay, so the Pharisee flashback. Here, here's what Paul was trying to figure out. Years prior, after the Damascus Road, after he's been blinded, and he's trying to figure out, what did I get so wrong of, of anybody? I knew the law as well or better than most, and still I missed the point. So God help me, what is the law all about? So here's, here's the Pharisee life. This is what a Pharisee normally would govern his life by on a daily basis. Number one, a Pharisee is to learn the law. And so they spent a lot of time learning the law. They would spend days opening scrolls and debating and reading and debating and reading until you really, you really got it. You, and, then, and then you would subdivide it and you'd wrestle over it. So if we're supposed to keep the Sabbath day holy and we're not supposed to work, what exactly does not work mean? Does that mean like, can I eat? Well, yeah, you need to eat. Can I breathe? Well, yeah, you need to breathe. Can I walk? Well, you go, well, no, 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 you can walk a little bit, but you don't want to walk too far because if you walk too far, that's like you're walking to work. So you can only go so far from your house. So this is the debates that the Pharisees would have. They were very serious about the law and working it out. So a Pharisee, number one, learns the law. The second step is do the law. Learn it, do it. Learn it, do it. Learn it, do it. So if Rabbi so-and-so says you can only walk 15 paces radius from your house, otherwise if you go 16 paces, you might actually be violating the Sabbath, then I'm going to do that. I'm going to go only 15 paces and I'm not going to go any farther because after all, I love the law and I'm going to obey. And God says it's good for you if you do this. Learn the law. Do the law. God is more pleased with you. Rinse and repeat. And that's what a Pharisee did. That's the life of a Pharisee right there. Learn the law. Do the law. God is more pleased with me when I do that. Repeat, tomorrow do the same thing. Over and you go in this loop, basically, of understanding God's requirements, making a list. Your list gets bigger because you understand more and more as you sit with the rabbis and the wise men. You understand more. You do more. You, you make sure you don't do the wrong things. And you work really hard to make sure that your life totally embodies in action what the law says to do. And if I'm successful doing with that, God is pleased with me. And if I fail at doing that, God is displeased with me. Now, this isn't just a Pharisee thing, by the way. <laughs> this is what most false religions do. This is the legalist perspective. Uh, a lot of people will say, well, I, I, you know, I don't really want to become a Christian because if I, be if I become a Christian, you're just going to give me a list of things I'm supposed to do. And you know what? I think I've already got a pretty long list of things I'm supposed to do. And I'm moderately happy with my goodness. So I don't think you can give me any more to do that will make me more good that I think is valuable. So hey, I'm good, literally. And religions, many false religions will come along saying, yeah, but there's more you, under, you need to understand. You need to, you need to know that God is more pleased with you if you do these things as well. And if you incorporate them into your life. And you know, well, oh, this is what I call mimicking the law. This isn't living the law, it's mimicking it. It's trying to look like it, but you're not really living it. So this is it, this Pharisee is it. And this is the state that Paul's mind was in when Jesus stopped him on the road to Damascus. I'm committed to learning the law, to doing the law, to pleasing God through that, and then spending the entire cycle of my days and weeks doing just that. So what is so wrong with that? I think Paul cried out with God for over a decade. If that's not it, what is? And if the law is so important, then what am I doing wrong? I mean, it's a very good question. It's a very good question. And today, Paul's... A lot of Paul's angst in that post-Damascus Road experience is going to come oozing out in chapter 7. Because he, I mean, what am I supposed to do then if I'm not supposed to make a list of the law and do it? It makes, seems to make sense. And God, you're saying you're not pleased with me? And God could come right back to him and say, well, you missed the Messiah, so how are you doing? <laughs> Somehow this not only is just wrong, but it diverts our attention from who Jesus is. Well, because, to get cut to the chase. In the end, who's responsible for pleasing God in this model? I am. But what pleases God in the real biblical model, the real biblical truth, is what Christ has done for us. 
And we just say yes. So it's really not about what we can accomplish. So let's take a look and see exactly how Paul unwound this, because I think part of what we'll see today is, is biographical. He comes back and he says, okay, so what's the deal? How am I supposed to relate to the law? Is the law sin now? Is that the new juncture we're coming to in Christ, that the law is sin? Well, no, that's not it at all. Okay, then what is it? Well, here we go. Hold on to your horses. If it had not been for the law, I wouldn't have known sin. For I would not have known what it is to covet if the law had said, you shall not covet. So you do something, Paul says. And, and it's innocent, the things that you do, but you don't know that it's wrong unless mom, on Mother's Day, unless mom says, stop doing that. Lays down the law. The law, in a sense, does that. Don't do that. Do, do you know what you're doing is wrong? Do you know what you're doing is against God's nature? It's, it's sin. Do you know that? And the law lays that line out. It points its finger at you, and it condemns you. Now, interestingly, Paul says, if the law hadn't come along, then I wouldn't know what coveting is. Do you know what, uh, in the Ten Commandments, which one of the ten is coveting? Number ten. Number ten. And do you know that it stands alone in the Ten Commandments? Because it's the only of the Ten Commandments that has, has entirely to do with the status of your heart's desires and not about the actions of your hands. The others have some part of heart desire, but this is 100%. 100%. He's saying, if I had not had the law, I wouldn't know that my heart, as it yearned for things, that that was actually sin. I thought... I thought kicking people was a sin. I thought pushing people over was a sin. I, I, I thought stealing from people was a sin. All these things that I do in, with, you know, with my hands and my... But actually wanting something is a sin? You mean there's something about the status of my heart in the Ten Commandments? That's a sin? It never seems... I mean, he doesn't talk about stealing right here. He just says wanting it. Is bad. And he, and he outlines it several ways, the different things that you want. So he says, if I had known about the law, I wouldn't have known the fact that even my heart's desires were against God's nature. Now, when we get in the role of the heart's desires, when you talk about sin, listen, I can, I can pretty much keep myself from stealing stuff. I, I haven't stolen anything since I was 11, I think. Help me out here, God. But anyway, so I can pretty much, I can pretty much keep myself from stealing. But you know what? I can't change what my heart wants. It just, it's just, it's there. It just, it wants stuff. And in fact, it's almost the purest communication of what idolatry is. To want something and expect life from something that's other than God itself, himself. That's not this covetousness. I try and look for life in other places. It's a state of the heart. One of the Ten Commandments is the state of your heart, not stealing, but wanting it. I think that's why it's so troubled Paul. Because for a Pharisee, it's easy to control the actions of your hands. I mean, even when your heart hates somebody, you can still be kind to them. But Jesus goes back later and says, listen, if you even hate them, you might as well be killing them because it's the same thing in terms of your heart's desires. The nature of the heart is really as big or bigger than anything else when it comes to sin. You are what your heart desires. And cultural pressures keep you from stealing and doing a whole bunch of other horrible things. But your heart still wants it, and that's what counts. So he says, if I hadn't known, hadn't had the law, I wouldn't know what sin is. It draws a line and it defines sin for us. Verse 8, but sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, produced in me all kinds of covetousness. For apart from the law, sin lies dead. What's he saying? Tell your children not to do something, and what do they do? They do it. And the law very much, in a way, does that. It says, you shouldn't do this. And part of your rebellious nature goes, oh yeah, why? And you try it. There is something about what the law does in pointing out sin that triggers our rebellious nature, and you say, well, I'm going to do it anyway. <laughs> it's just because I can. Just because I want to. It's going to be great. Of course, if you, you pursue these things and find out in the end of that road, it's not great. It's actually quite a waste of time. And you can spend an entire lifetime chasing down these wastes of time, sin that entices us. What he's saying right here is that, you know, here's the whole deal. Sin somehow sneaks around the law. Does that make the law bad? No, sin itself is somehow taking advantage of the good thing of the law and enticing you to do bad. It's not the law's fault. It's not the law's fault. It's your fallen rebellious nature's fault. 
that you want to pursue the things that are done. So that's what he's saying. So there's something about the law that when it shines a light on the line between good and bad and you see sin clearly, our rebellious nature says, well, if that's bad, I want to try it. Don't blame the law. If I go racing down the street at 75 miles an hour and I get caught, do I tell the policeman when he puts his head in my window, do you know, what, you know how fast you're going? I say, hey, it's not my fault. It's the law's fault. <laughs> I'm writing you a ticket because you're all messed up. You can't blame the law when you decide to rebel. And that's what Paul's saying right here. The law's not bad. The law's giving us a clear understanding of right and wrong. But if you tend to violate, if you rebel against it, don't blame the law. The law is not bad. The law is just a statement of the reality of the nature and goodness of God. But if you want to break that, don't blame the law. Don't blame the law. That's all he's saying right here. Covetousness increased. Verse 9. I was once alive apart from the law. Which, what he's saying here, I wasn't condemned to death because I didn't know the law. The law condemns me. I was kind of alive apart from the law. But you know, when the commandment came, sin came alive and I died. Sin seemed to percolate up through the midst of the law's definition of sin. And I died. That's the result of sin. Because the wages of sin is death. So there it is. The very commandment that promised life proved to be death to me. God says, here's my law. Do this and live. Do this and live. The very thing that promised life to me somehow has proved to be death to me. So I get back to my question, Paul says. Is the law bad? Because when I was ignorant of the law, isn't ignorance bliss? <laughs> well, sin is still sin, even when it's not defined. It's still sin. And a path of sin is going to take you to the same end whether it's declared by the law or not by the law. In a real sense, the law can save you from the dead end roads of sin. And you don't have to taste it. I mean, we do this with our kids all the time. As they're growing up, we say, you know, as you're growing up, you really don't want to do this because it's going to end with this. And so take it from me. I was an idiot when I was 15, and I did this, and this is where it got me. So hey, trust me. Don't do this. <laughs> and of course, your kids say, yeah, right. Because <laughs> they got to check it out too. And, and as a parent, it breaks your heart because you want to be able to, you, you would love to be able to protect your children from the consequences of their bad choices. Because after all, you probably made the same bad choice and you want to tell them, let me give you a, let me give you a clue. I want to save you the heartbreak of getting to the end of this. But as rebellious creatures inherited this rebellion from Adam and Eve, we want to just go against that and kick the goads and not take the advice. But I got to tell you, what, when God says don't do this or do this, he's not doing it because he's an ogre or because he's an oppressive parent. He's trying to save you the heartbreak at the end of the road. In that sense, experience is not the best teacher. <laughs> it, re it really isn't. And, and you know, I think that with my kids. You know, if you just... If you just if you just did what I said, you would not be in this position right here. I'm not here to say I told you so, but, I, but when your heart breaks, my heart breaks. I'm trying to clue you in. And I think that's very much the case with God and the law. Here's the deal. Here's good. Here's evil. You know, you're going to choose life or death because the way you sin is death. You can go one way or the other. Let me tell you, God's saying, I don't want you to go down the road of evil and sin because it leads to death. Trust me, but we don't trust. In rebellion, we, we rebel. So the very commandment that promised life proved to be death for me. It, it, I realized I was on the road to death. For sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment deceived me and through it killed me. Don't blame the law. Blame sin itself. Sin itself lurking around the definition of its own sinfulness, which is what the law does. Sin seemed to have deceived me and killed me. How does it deceive you? I mean, we know this. We know this. A life of sin says, trust me, come with me, and everything will be wonderful. Forget what all those old fogies say. Forget what that old fogey in the sky says. Trust your instincts. Trust me, sin says, follow me, and life will be beautiful. And in the end, it's not. So then you figure, well, I must have picked the wrong path. So you try it again. And another sin says the same siren call. It deceives you. Sin, sin has no traction in your life unless it was attractive. And it's attractive. Satan has designed it to be attractive. 
And he attracts you to it through an absolute bald-faced lie about where it's going to go. And somehow, we suck up that lie every time and go, okay. And in the end, find death and destruction. Prodigal Son's a really great example. Prodigal Son figures, I think the best course for my life is not living with my old fogey dad because he's oppressive and I just can't do what I want to do and I want to do what I want to do, but I can't leave here because I don't have the money to do my own stuff. So I'll go to my dad and say, I want, I want half of what you have because when you're dead, I get half. So give it to me now while I'm still you know, young and I'll go spend it and I'll finally use half of your funds which are coming to me to fund what will make me happy. And it doesn't. It doesn't. In the end, he's eating with pigs. And that's a great picture of the enticement of sin and the end of sin. Uh, it's exactly that. So what Paul's saying right here is that sin, sin's head popped up as soon as the law came up says, Hi, I'm sin. Follow me. You'll have a great time. Don't blame the law. Blame sin. But when it deceives me and entices me and I follow it, it leads me down the road to death. It kills me. Oh, oh, oh. There, is, there is no great side to sin. And this is why when, you know, when, people, when people come to me and we're in a counseling situation and they ask me, you know, uh, here's where I am and I'm feeling miserable and do, do you have some kind of like wand thing in your desk drawer that you can kind of go whoosh, and you know, and I'll be, feel better? And what I have to go, to go back to is say, no, you know, you, you went, you went into this thing that you thought would be really productive and bring you life. And now you're sitting here and saying, but I don't have life. Whiz, make it better? No, you have to turn around and come off that path. And you have to say, you know, that, that God, God restricts things because he loves us, not because he's an ogre. Not because he's trying to cheat us from life. He's trying to cheat us from death. That's the whole point. He's like a father in that sense. So that's what it does. It, it seizes the opportunity with the presence of the law because it gets defined and it deceives me and then it kills me. That's a bad deal. So no, the law is not bad. The law is holy and the commandment is holy. That's the working outs of the law. And it's righteous and it's good. It's good. It's good. Holy, by the way, whenever you see holy, don't, don't think of that as just being like uber good. Uh, whole, you know, good, and then you got super good, that's holy. Nah, and that's the wrong way to think. That's not, that's not right at all. But when you think of the word holy, think about set apart for, for a righteous purpose, set apart for a different purpose. Uh, so that, the, you know, if you leave something here, in a sense, it gets dirty. Holy means to take it out of the place that'll dirtify it and take it to a place that'll remain untouched by the dirt. Okay, and that's, that's the whole thing. I, I use this all the time because I think this every time I use my toothbrush. I protect what my toothbrush is used for. And I don't scrub the sink or the toilet with it. Because I want to keep it set apart for a clean purpose. And as soon as I start using it in the context of all the other dirt in the bathroom, it's no good anymore. And that's what holy is. Holy is to deliberately, the idea, primary idea in holiness is to remove something out of the contaminating place that it is and set it apart for something very good and uncontaminated. That's why when we say God is holy, that we're saying that he's, he's deliberately not really a part of this place. This place does not contaminate him. He is different from this place. He's not messed up with sin like we are. He's holy. And when God's making us holy, think of it, it's a movement again. He's pulling us out of the contaminating thing that we're in the middle of and setting us like toothbrushes in a place that can be used for clean, places, clean purposes. That's what, he, that's what holy is. Holy does mean that it's not contaminated by the impurities of sin, but it really is that because it's taken out of it. That's what makes it happen. That's holy. So the law, hey, comes from not around here. It's set apart from here. It's not contaminated by the junk of this place. The law is holy. It's set apart for a great and clean purpose. It's not messed up, for instance, by the good intentions of men. It's, it's good stuff. It's holy, it's righteous, which means it's a definition of good from God's character in the uh, presentation of man. That's a good way to put it. And it's good. And by the way, that word good means good. <laughs> Thanks, that brought me great insight, Jim. Well, in, in the Greek, there's two words for good. One of, them, one of them means like intrinsically beautiful in a sense, you know? Uh, when, you see, when you see a beautiful act of love that's done, 
that just, just all by itself, what, what you want to do is take a picture of it and sort of put it up in your wall and say, that's oh, really good. That was such a good thing. That was, it just, it, it, it's almost like an artistic word. It's, that, it's a beautiful thing to look at. But then there's this other word that's used more often. And uh, in, in fact, it's the same Greek word that if your name is Agatha comes from, it's agathos, it means, it means good. So if you name a child Agatha, then they have to be good for the rest of their life. You need to live up to my... But agathos is, is much more of a pragmatic word. Agathos means it's something that's beneficial to you. So, you know, for me, wearing shoes when I take long walks are agathos for me because they're good, they're beneficial for me. They'll keep me from walking on stones and things will be good. It's all, so this word, this word good is defined by its benefit to you. So when I see good things happen to you, what I'm saying in my mind is I, that's a very beneficial thing to your life. That's why it's good. And something that's not beneficial to you that tears you down, that's bad. So, th- so this whole very pragmatic word, agathos, is all about whether it really benefits you. So guess which one of these two this good word is right here. Now see, I would guess the first one, the beautiful one, but it's not. It's the beneficial one. The law is beneficial to you. That's what he's saying. It's useful and beneficial to you. The law doesn't bring death. The law is not your enemy. The law brings benefit to you. That's why God could say to Israelites, do this and live. You'll find life in these things. There's life in this law. And there's not death. That's what he's saying. So, so Paul says, and this is, I think, this is one of his biggest ahas, I think, in that decade after the Damascus Road. So what is the law about? Is the law bad for me? No, the law always will be holy, set apart from here, not tainted by this stuff. It's always holy. It represents God's righteousness. It's beneficial for me. So what is my relationship to the law now after Christ? See, this, is, this is what Paul's still trying to work out with his Pharisee flashback. So what is the law then? If it's good, and if this whole scene on the mountain is good, so, I, so uh, help me. He's still wrestling with this. So he asks a question right here. So did that which is good bring death to me? So I've already concluded the law is good. The law is good. But it seems like it, it's brought death to me. It seems like somehow I'm condemned under the sins I'm at. Maybe, maybe ignorance would have been bliss, but you know, so the law is good. So is it introducing death into my life? This is what, why it put Paul 10 years to figure this out. He's... he's well, the answer, of course, is by no means. Same phrase again. It's good. The law is good. It's wonderfully good. Did it bring death to me? By no means. It was sin. It was sin. It was sin producing death in me through what is good. The law was good, but sin took advantage of that in order that sin might be shown to be sin. The law came that sin might be shown to be sin. And through the commandment, that's the working out of the law, might become sinful beyond measure. Now, can you put your Pharisee flashback hat back on? Remember when Paul was a Pharisee just before the Damascus Road experience. He felt like that if he learned the law and did the law, he pleased God and he would do more of that. It seemed as though in a real sense, he was a gooder person because of the law, right? That's what he's thinking. But what, the, but what he's under the false impression of, as he's a Pharisee, is that he's not any better than anyone else. In fact, his life is riddled with sin. And you say that to a Pharisee, and they'll raise up and smack you over the head with a rolled-up newspaper or a scroll of Isaiah. You don't claim that someone whose professional job is learning the law and doing the law is, is riddled with sin. But what Paul's saying is that the law finally told me that even though I thought I was getting somewhere, I'm still riddled with sin. And what the law did in my life is it told me what sin is. The law showed me that sin might be displayed as what it is. It's sin. You know, again, in a lot of false religions, people, if you come to someone and say, well, you know what? We've all sinned. You're a sinner. I'm a sinner. We're all sinners. Believe it or not, people don't take that story well. Because they like to believe in themselves as, well, well, I'm not perfect. You know, I could do some good things, but I don't think it's right that you should characterize me as a sinner, really. I mean, I can do good, so that doesn't mean I'm a sinner. But what if you're riddled with sin? (laughs) 
You're a sinner. That's the way it works. You're a sinner. So the law comes out to draw the line and say, you're a sinner. Well, no, actually, I just do some things kind of suboptimal. I don't think you can really say I'm a sinner. After all, I have a great appreciation for good and for goodness. I think there's a lot of goodness in man, and I think there's a lot of goodness in me, and I think it's right for you to completely you know, whitewash me with the brush that I'm a sinner. But if you sin, you're a sinner. That's what the law says. That's what the law says. That's what the law says. So Paul, one of his big ahas, the law came in order that sin might be shown to be exactly what it is. It's sin. And not only is it a little sin, it's sin beyond measure. You can't even measure it. You're so riddled with it. This is in the, you know, in the cancer kind of metaphor. This is when cancer metastasizes. It's not just localized in one organ anymore. It's through your entire body. And that's what sin is. It's metastasized through every piece of who you are. Yes, you can appreciate goodness. Yes, you can squeak out a little goodness from time to time. But the bottom line, the law says, is that it's through me without measure. I'm really messed up. And that's what the law is saying, which should be a depressing thing. But it's not depressing. There's an answer. He says in 14, we know that the law is spiritual. What? You mean, what? Okay, hold on to that for a second. We know that the law is spiritual. But I'm of the flesh, sold under sin. The law is spiritual. What does that mean? Well, remember that thing about the 10th commandment about coveting? It's actually the na- nature of your heart, the state of your heart. That's what we're talking about. In a real spiritual sense, the definition of sin isn't just what your hands find to do that's evil. It's what your heart places its desires on. Now we're in the realm of the spiritual. You inside, the invisible you, want things that are evil. Maybe the outside of you, because of cultural pressures, doesn't follow through with what your heart desires. But the inside of you, the spirit of who you are, wants evil. The law is spiritual. It's really pointing out, when you look at the law, it's not, just a, it's not a checklist of things that you do on the outside of your life. It's really, it, it's really a spotlight on the disgusting nature of the inside of your life. And that's what's impossible to control. It's spiritual. But then he comes up after that and he says, but look, I'm made of flesh. I'm sold under sin. What? Well, he's using some metaphors you probably don't catch. He says, I'm flesh. When he says flesh, from this point on in Paul's letters, when he says flesh, he's talking about this. What I always, every time I read flesh in in what Paul's saying, I think this. Don't laugh. That's a muscle. (laughs) Think muscles. Think muscles. So he says, the law is spiritual, but I'm just muscles. I can only lift so many things before I hurt my back. And before, I mean, I can only, I'm limited. I'm limited in what my muscles can do. That's what his flesh is. So he says, here's the law with a spiritual mandate about the nature of my heart. But me, I'm just muscles. Two different worlds. And not only that, am I just muscles in that particular sense. I mean, so it really, it, it starts to convey the idea of what I'm capable of doing. The law sets this spiritual standard, but this is all I'm capable of. See, it's like two different worlds. But then he goes one step further in this. Not only am I just muscles, but I'm sold under sin. And he's really bringing this picture to mind. It's a slave auction. The slave auction. I'm a slave to sin. It's like I've been on the, on the block and I've been auctioned off. And guess who my purchaser was? Mr. Sin. And since sin purchased me, I am no longer free to do what I want. I'm only free to do what my master wants. That's what a slave is. My master is sin, and it's purchased me, and it makes me do what it wants me to do. So, the law is spiritual. I only have muscles. And by the way, I only work for another employer, and that employer is sin. So this isn't going to work, he's saying. It's just not going to work. I cannot, even though the law is spiritual, and it's good, and it's holy, and it's righteous, I only have muscles, and I'm enslaved to sin. I can't, I just, I, if, it's, if it's demanding me to do something, I can't do it. And he's going to get very explicit. Remember back here he said, so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin? He already talked about the solution. So there really is, before Christ, an enslavement, a bondage to sin. Or as he alludes to right here, in a sense, we have been sold off to serve another master, and that master's sin. And we don't have a choice before Christ. 
And then he, then he gets to the heart of his conundrum after Damascus Road. I don't understand my own actions. I don't do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Now, if I do what I do not want, I agree with the law that it's good. It's condemning me. So he's saying, here's, here's my conundrum. As a good Pharisee, we're still partially in the Pharisee flashback. I love the law. The writer of the Psalms loves the law. I'm supposed to fall even more deeply in love with it. I love the aspects of what the law is. But hey, the thing that I love, I don't do. And the things that I don't love, I'm doing. What is so messed up with me? And this is the fundamental, this is the core of, I think, what Paul dealt with after Damascus. How is it that me as a Pharisee can love the law so much and yet do it so poorly? And that's the conundrum of a Pharisee. And when you don't do it well, you fake it. And that's the rule of the hypocrite. (laughs) Why is it that I as a Pharisee love the law and yet I don't do it? What is going on? It should be that the things I love, I do. Isn't that true for all of us? I love the things that I, and I do the things that I love. But when it comes to the law, I'm messed up, Paul finally realized. As a Pharisee, I thought I was making traction to please God by doing the law. But the law that I love, I don't do. What's wrong with me? Ah, now we're changing our relationship to the law. 17. So now, listen, it's no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. For I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh. Why does he say it's no longer I who do it? Because the I he's speaking about wants to do good and appreciates the beauty of good, appreciates the beauty of righteousness. Like Psalm 119, Psalm 19, love the law. It's like honey, it's like gold, it's like what's beautiful. That's me, but it doesn't translate into my members. I do the opposite of it. There must be something genetically messed up about me. That on the one hand, the I that's the true me wants one thing, but the me that does it does something else. And guess what that difference, that genetic problem is? Sin. It dwells in me. See that? Sin dwells in me. It lives in you. It lives in you. And it's your master. For I know that nothing good dwells in me. That is, if I want to fulfill the law, I can't because there's no ability I have to make it. I just can't do it. It dwells in me. That is, it dwells in my muscles, (laughs) in my flesh, in my ability to accomplish on my own. Sin dwells there. And now you start to get the understanding of what happens when we talk about the fall of mankind, what happened in the Garden of Eden. We are tragically flawed to only have the capability to do certain things. And unfortunately, it's not satisfy the law, which is spiritual. Well, let's get rid of the law, then we don't have a problem. No, no, that's not it. The law is good and holy and righteous, and it's, it's a statement of goodness. And actually, when you look at the nature of the law, it's a lovable thing. And Jesus condemned the Pharisees on one occasion, and he said, you know, you do this, you do this stupid, well, he didn't use that word, but you tie the dill, mint, and cumin, which is actually a good thing to do. But you forget the bigger parts of the law. And what are the bigger parts of the law? Justice. I love justice, by the way. Mercy. I love mercy. Faithfulness. I love faithfulness. There's a lot to love about the law because it talks about good. It's the good that we're pre-programmed by God to appreciate and want more of. (laughs) But the crazy thing that Mr. Pharisee Flashback and us have is we can love it to death and we'll still never do it. What's wrong with us? Sin dwells in this capable body. It doesn't work its way out. It's, It's there. It's frustrating. I have the desire to do what's right but not the ability to carry it out. And let that sink in. Let that sink in. I have the desire to do what's right. Now, this is a Pharisee speaking, and this is us speaking. I want to do what's right. I love what's right. I love the holiness and righteousness of what the law is. I love what it speaks for. I love it speaks to the nature of God, and he's good. I love it to death, but I can't do it. Ah! Now, this... This does damage to his original Pharisee rule. Remember the Pharisee rule? Learn the law, do the law, God is pleased, repeat, rinse and repeat. What part of those four things does this blow up? Number two. You can learn the law, you can love the law, 
We can't do the law. God's not pleased. His entire Pharisee world fell apart when he suddenly realized that the law was given to highlight sin, not to give us a means to fight sin. Because as soon as you try and fight sin by just doing the law, you fail. You fail. Well, that doesn't make sense. I love the law, but I can't do it. Oh, I have the desire to do what's right. And by the way, when I speak to someone and say you're a sinner, they say, but I have the desire what's right, and I have a great appreciation for right, and I love what good is. Surely when I get to, to heaven's gates and after I die, and God says, why should you come in? I'll say, because I love good so much. No, it, that doesn't work. It doesn't work. Is it part of who you are in totality? Does it reflect God's nature in your life? I don't have the ability to carry it out. And unfortunately, a huge number of people are living this lie of the Pharisee life, thinking that what I have to do is keep doing the law, but Paul's saying, I can't do it. I can't do it. Now this is why so many times when we talk about making a list of the law and, and legalism and stuff like that, we'll say over and over again, God gave his law, but he didn't expect you to be able to do it. Well, then why would he give us the law? to highlight how far short we've fallen. Well, and then I'm supposed to do it. No, you still can't do it. <laughs> well, then why didn't he give me the law? If he, if he gave me, a, you know, if I go to school and my first grade teacher says, come back tomorrow with your, with your you know, your addition table homework done, and, and I come back and, and I do the addition table and I give it to, to my teacher and she says, oh, wonderful work, I'm so pleased. You know, you learn how to do your additions, you do your additions, you come back. Isn't that how it works with God? <sighs> You don't have the equipment to do the law. That's the problem. Well, why not? Well, it somehow got lost in the fall. That's what it is. That's what it is. You can still appreciate it tremendously. You can love it tremendously. But like the good Pharisee that Paul was, in those 10 years, he wrestles with, why can't I do it? Sin lives in my flesh. And although I love the law and I have the desire to do what's right, I don't have the ability to carry it out. And now we're stuck because sin still lingers in our body like a bad cancer. The law still hovers over our head as a standard for good that we can't do, and we are stuck. We're just stuck. Can't do the law. For I don't do the good I want. He's going to state it in the opposite. I don't do the good that I want, but the evil I don't want is, is what I keep doing. Ah! Pharisee flashback. Now, if I do what I don't want, it, it's no longer I who do it. That is the I who appreciates the law. <coughs> but it's sin itself that indwells within me. It's, it's part of who I am. It's my genetics. It lives inside me like a parasite. How can I get this out of me? So I find it to be a law <laughs> that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. Since we're talking about the law, let me give you a law I learned in my 10 years after Damascus Road. Here's the law. The law is when I want to do right, evil's in my right hand. That's the law, if you want to get down to it. That's the law. I want to do good, I don't do it. I find it a law that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God, in my inner being. I love what it is. I love this goodness. I delight in this goodness. But I see in my members... When you see members think hands, feet, everything on the outside of you. But I see in my members another law, waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Ah, you can just hear the frustration just welling up inside of him. But I delight in the law, but what's wrong with my hands? I keep doing evil. <laughs> Why am I so messed up? Why am I so messed up? There's another law waging war against the law of my mind. My mind appreciates the goodness of the law. I love the goodness of what the law says. <sighs> but this thing is making me captive to the law of sin. And there we come back to this captiveness. The law itself, it, it, the sin itself is like a bad master from the auctions of the slaves. It's your master. You're capt captive to it. It dwells inside of me. It's actually incorporated into part of who I am. Now, that's a, big, that's a big understanding that Paul had after the Damascus Road. Sin was something for him as a Pharisee that was always outside of you, something that was out here. Sin entices. And, and you, know, you, you fought a daily battle when sin would call you to not participate in sin, so I can keep sin out, out of my life, out there. 
And a successful Pharisee would say, I keep sin out of my life on every piece. Go out there. But what Paul came to understand was sin is not out there. It's in here. <laughs> it's, it's part of me. It dwells inside of me. Even a good Pharisee can't keep sin at bay when sin is not at arm's length. It's in heart's length. Oh, can't do it. It dwells in my members. Wretched man that I am. <laughs> this, I can see Paul rolling on the ground after Damascus Road saying, I am so messed up. I am so wretched. I'm a Pharisee and I know the law and the law is telling me how bad I am. Man, I am so messed up. Oh, wretched man that I am. Who will deliver me from this body of death? This body of sin that sin dwells in. Who's going to free me from this? I love the law, but I don't do it. I'm messed up. Wretched man that I am. Who will free me? And you know the answer to this. Christ does. Christ does. Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, I myself serve the law of God with my mind. As I love the law. But man, with my flesh, I serve the law of sin. And here's the conundrum of mankind. We're built in with an appreciation and a love for what's good. There's very little disagreement among various cultures worldwide about what's good. On the good things, you know, the core things. You don't steal from each other. You don't kill each other, you know. You help each other when people are in need. You do all these things. I mean, there's a great agreement on that. It's a, it's a remarkable coincidence that all mankind seems to have a very homogeneous idea of what's good. And it's also another interesting coincidence that everyone doesn't do it. <laughs> isn't that bizarre? I mean, come on, isn't that just bizarre? We can appreciate it, but we can't do it. And that's what Paul's saying. This is the condition of man. An appreciation and a love for what's good, but an abysmal failure doing it. But thanks be to God through Christ Jesus. He frees us from this. He frees us from this. So he's left us at the end of chapter, chapter 7 here, putting us on the edge of a cliff again. So what is it that Jesus has done in my life that now I can walk differently in my relationship to sin? Okay, so I'm not in bondage to sin. I was at one time sold on the auction block of slaves to sin, and it was my master, and I wasn't free to do what I wanted to do. I, had to, I was only free to do what it wanted me to do. I'm free from that. I'm not going to go back and voluntarily report to work for sin because I realize that the payday stinks, okay? I understand that I'm no longer bound by the law to make a list every day and do it and do it really well and do it tomorrow and hope I can please God. I know that's not. So how do I do this? How has Christ freed me from this bizarre problem of loving good but never doing it? The problem is the law isn't just a flesh issue, it's a heart issue. The law is spiritual. It's touching on... Right. And that's why the next chapter is all about the Spirit. Yay! Oh, yay! There's a real fix here. There's a real fix. And we're not talking about a fix that affects your salvation. We're talking about a fix that changes you right now in your relationship to sin and it's nagging persistence that you just, it's like flies around a dead body. Go away. That has been changed in Christ. Right now, starting in the next hour if you want to. And that's what chapter 8's about. This is this new life in the Spirit. Yes! So we're finally going to get there. We're finally going to get there. That's his, that's his teaser for that. So the detour today, the question is, is the law bad? The answer, no. But it is necessary. It is necessary. <laughs> so there, there is a popular misconception in Christendom that there's grace and there's law. There's grace and there's law. There's grace and there's law. Grace, good. Law, good. Bad. Don't, don't, don't go there, because that's not it at all. The law is wonderful. It's wonderful. It's something that you could fall in love with in a heartbeat. The law is a wonder. It's a statement of goodness. Think of the best utopian society you can think of where people live lives of exemplary goodness for one another. You know, random acts of kindness happen on a minute-by-minute on a -minute basis. I mean, it's a wonderful place. Think of what that looks like in terms of the law, the code for those kinds of citizens. And look at that community and say, that's where I want to live. But you better not. Because as soon as you go there, you'll wreck it. Because yeah. flesh dwells in you. <laughs> but Christ gets us there. So is the law bad? No, it's necessary. How is it necessary? It exposes my delusion of goodness. And that's exactly what it is. It's a delusion. 
But I can do some good. I know, but you're riddled with sin. You're riddled with sin. It's like going to someone who's had metastasized cancer and saying, well, I, my fingernail doesn't have it. Uh, you're riddled with sin. That's the way it is. It exposes my delusion of goodness. And, and by the way, Pharisees had a very well-developed delusion of goodness. And that's what took Paul 10 <laughs> years to work out. He wasn't getting anywhere. It also reveals my powerlessness. Remember? It reveals how powerless I am. I'm only, I can only do this much. But the law is spiritual, but I'm flesh. I can appreciate the law, but I don't do the law. I find I'm ineb- unable to do the law. So not only does the law show us our delusion of goodness, it shows us our inability to make ourselves good. Those are both important things because in the end, it rebukes my Pharisee life and it leads me to Christ. It leads me to Christ because I have to say to myself, which I think Paul said to himself after, after Damascus, there's got to be a better answer and it must be in Christ, the one who stopped me on the road. How am I supposed to be freed from this body of sin and death? Can Christ do this? Now, we're not just talking salvation. We're talking tomorrow when sin knocks on the door. Can something happen to change this radical genetic problem I have where my mind and my heart loves good, but my body does evil? And Christ can do that. By the way, I say it leads us to Christ because we looked at Galatians last year. In Galatians 3, it says exactly this. The law is our tutor. It's like the... The tutor is someone back in Greek times that would be, that would be um, employed by the family to take the kids to school, get them in school, and bring them back again. It's a leading tutor. It takes them to the place. So in a sense, what he's saying, it's called pedagogos in Greek. The law, in a way, is not meant to be the end. It's meant to accompany us to where the end is. And that's what the law is good at. It points us to Christ. It points us to Christ. Whew. Now we said back in chapter 6, we're released from the law, having died to that which held us captive, so that we serve in the new way of the Spirit and not the old way of the written code. Okay, I want to know what this is. I think you do too. (laughs) So that's what we're doing next week, chapter 8. The new way of the Spirit. It's not a matter of making a list of what the law requires and do my woulda, coulda, shoulda, that's what I have to do tomorrow. It's not a matter of being frustrated because sins in my life, even though I appreciate goodness and I can't do it. It's not about there's something new radically changed in how I live life tomorrow post-Christ in my life. And that's what I want. The new life in the Spirit. You can cheat and read chapter 8 tomorrow. (laughs) Or you can just read it several times because it's great stuff. That's next week. So that's what we're going to take a look at. And Paul's going to finally, after this detour, say, now you can take a deep breath and realize that in Christ, I no longer have to have Pharisee flashbacks. I can live a new life of freedom in Christ starting tomorrow where my relationship with sin is broken and my ability to do good comes from a reworking of my heart, not from an external code finally. And the Pharisee becomes a follower of Jesus. And the Pharisees become followers of Jesus. Because until you make that break, you're not following Jesus. And there's great freedom. There's great freedom in that. We're going to sing this song as we finish this morning. And as they're coming up, let me just pray for us and we'll be done today. Oh, Father, thank you. Because I'm with Paul What a wretched man that I am. Ah, there's so much about the law, so much about your righteousness that I find absolutely stunningly beautiful. Just beautiful. And I'm made for that and I want that. But Lord, before Christ, I couldn't do it. it It seems as though the more I pursued what felt right, things went backwards. They went to death instead of life. And then, and then Christ came, not only to make me right with you, but, but to radically, transformatively start weeding through my life and changing my heart's desires and changing the propensity that my, my members have to be bound to sin, freeing me from that. Lord, again, we go back to Isaiah 61 that Jesus, Jesus read there in Nazareth. And Lord, we have experienced the same thing in coming to know you. Freedom 
freedom for the captives, binding up the brokenhearted, welcoming the wretched ones, and Lord, that's what we are. And not only changing our relationship with you, accepting us in your presence, justifying us, being made right with you, but now going through this remarkable transformation. It's remarkable transformation. Lord, there's, I, I can't believe that the things, of the, the, the sin that I clung to so much in my past is not even, doesn't even taste right anymore. How did you do that? And yet that's what you're doing. And Lord, at the same time, I've, I've realized this increasing gulf between your righteousness and my goodness. I can't do it. And if it wasn't for the cross that spanned that distance, I would be uh, depressed every day. And yet, you have remade me. You have remade us. You've, you've transformed our hearts. You've transformed the works of our hands. And now, goodness and righteousness are a part of our life, not because we're supposed to do it, but because from the deepest recesses of our hearts, we love it. And, and God, I have to admit, I, I can't engineer that. I, I can't force that. It's something clearly you've done. And it's something that to this very day I can look back over these decades and say, that's how I know Christ has come into my life because I'm different in a way I could never change. Thank you for loving us even when we were far from clean, even when we were wretched. Thank you for freeing us from this bondage, this delusion of our goodness. And thank you that even in the midst of our despair and hopelessness, you found us, you picked us up, you drew us to yourself, you exposed your love to us, and our lives and our hearts have never been the same ever since. And thank you for dealing with this problem in our flesh, loving the law, but not doing it. And now that's not the case. You're changing us. So we thank you for all this now. Such good news, such good news. And Father, I pray that next week you'd make us hungry and thirsty for this new way of the Spirit. What is that? How do we do that? How do we participate in that? You've freed us from this old bondage, this old master. What is this new life like? That's what we want. That's what we want. New life in the Spirit. So thank you for your word that so clearly guides us and directs us into life and that warns us about death. And so we thank you for your law. Thanks in Jesus' name. Amen.